So without further ado, welcome back to Why Will No One Date These Guys, a podcast with two siblings where we talk about sex, relationships, um, gender issues, whatever else we're feeling at any given moment in time. Uh, I'm Jewel Guy. I'm Naomi Guy. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, Before we get to her, though, we are going to briefly sample our apple beer. It's a soda beers, apple beer, pure cane sugar, alcohol-free, gluten-free, all-natural, family-owned. I picked this up at an Ace Hardware because that's where you buy soda now, I guess. You know, if we were actually good guests, we would have sent our guest a sample of this. This is a really good point. Um, (laughs) This is a failing of ourselves. Okay. (laughs) Naomi, I've, I've taken a sip. Um, I enjoy it. It's like apple juice that's been slightly fermented. Mine was, yeah, it, it definitely just tastes like apple cider with carbonation to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm very interested in knowing what our guest is sipping on when we introduce her in just a moment. So um, <laughs> without further ado, whoop, it's telling me I can't minimize Zoom. Uh, for our listeners, this is the first episode we're recording over Zoom because our guest is currently in California. I will do my best to... Um, Give her the hype she deserves. So she's an artist by trade, the best friend of our mother. She introduced me to the wonders of green tea ice cream. She lives in the cutest small town outside of San Francisco and runs a weed-themed podcast called the Princeton Cannabis Review. It's Bibiana. Welcome (laughs) to the podcast, Bibi. Good morning. Um, I'm Bibiana Princeton. I um, I started my podcast, the Princeton Cannabis Review, because... I want to normalize weed culture for people, especially my generation. Uh, I've been enjoying cannabis for about four decades, and I've known these guys before they were they were here. So I feel honored to be on your podcast. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, Yeah, I think it might not be immediately obvious why we decided to have you on. Um, And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, We were working together, BB, on your podcast, what, two years ago, year and a half ago now? Um, you wanted to start a podcast and and talk about like weed culture. And we were actually inspired because you made it look so effortless and easy to do our own thing. Um, but the reason I think we want to have you on today is, um, you're an older individual. You've had a lot of experiences, both good and bad within relationships. And I think you can talk intelligently about something that comes up a lot in relationships and probably needs to be discussed more than it is, which is drug use. Um, and I think there's a healthy way of going about drug use and probably an unhealthy way, um, just as there are probably better for you drugs and less good for you drugs. Um, and we really wanted to hear kind of your thoughts, given that you run this Weed Theme podcast about what like a good amount of maybe weed consumption is and maybe some rules and prohibitions surrounding that. Um, so, uh, Naomi, did you want to start with the first question? Yeah. So BB, obviously, um, we love you so much and we know so much about you, but our audience doesn't. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you want people to know about you? I I grew, I'm 60 years old. I grew up in uh, San Francisco in the seventies. I was born in Southern California. Um, my parents immigrated from Austria and um, I was first born in this country, and uh, my dad was a single parent uh, for a long time. Um, <clears throat> and weed was weed was something that was around me. And especially when I went to college, uh, that's when I really enjoyed it and have ever since. And I think that uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, stories out there that say, oh, you have to have a disease and then then you embrace cannabis again. And what I've found is that I've enjoyed it all my life. And and the, the shame around it is uh, still there, the stigma, um, you know, and and frankly, it's 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 the one thing that's allowed me to maintain my life. And I think that's a lot f- can be said for a lot of people. And, um, you know, now with all the research coming out, there's all this great information that needs to be put out there. So that's what I'm thinking about cannabis. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, your podcast is called the Princeton Cannabis Review, is it not? Right. So so I try weed and then I um, smoke with friends or, you know, people who become my friends and 
you know, we just talk about their lives because people have a, a whole life and and they might smoke weed. It's it's not like, um, you know, it, these are separate things. It, they kind of go hand in hand. And there's a lot of creative people out there. There's a lot of, um, you know, what I hope to uh, bring exposure to, <clears throat> excuse me, is is the industry now because it is legal or before it was illegal. So mm -hmm. how, do, how do you become legal and how do you support these people? Because you've been smoking weed all this time. So right, I just right. want to help them. Mm -hmm. um, so you grew up in San Francisco in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and that was a very different time and place than where we are at the moment. You know, we grew up in very briefly in Indianapolis on my part, my brother's part. Naomi has grown up only in Arizona um, and there's several decades separating ourselves. But what were kind of the messages you were receiving when you were younger about dating and relationships and settling down and having kids, the whole nine yards? What, 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 what did you hear growing up about your role as a woman? I was thinking about that. I was like, well, how long was I actively dating, you know, from you know the and then the serious relationship so it was probably only about five years after college and that was like you know early 80s mm -hmm. so we're talking about <clears throat> the early 80s where people were, were way more hedonistic you know <laughs> cocaine and and you know and all that stuff and like no phones and no distractions like that and it was um to put it frankly, there was just a lot of sex, just a lot of sex and, and, and things you do before you have sex. So it was, those were the kind of dates and it was, you know, more for the adventure, the thrill. And, and it was like, so you had your first lover who would last about a year and then you had all these other partners. And then the, the one who ends up becoming your, your, life partner is um you know the one that basically stays with you so you can't sleep with anybody else because everybody was sleeping with each other so it was very free sexually um you know drugs were involved you know mainly for me marijuana and um you know it was actually the person who i ended up marrying was the one guy who who seduced me so it was <laughs> it was you know it was just the way it happened and um, then afterwards, um, you know, I was married about 15 years, happily. It took about um, six years to get divorced. And um, it was directly um, as horrible as it was great, the marriage. Uh, the divorce was horrible. And, um, uh, you know, and then I think when I came out of all that, and I didn't date for quite a while. I was, it was crazy. I was like, well, what, how do you do this? And the internet, and I don't know, I just didn't quite get internet dating. Um, you know, it was maybe like five, six years. Then I, I had a serious relationship, but it was because, you know, it was somebody who knew me and said, you know, let's go for a walk, you know, mm -hmm. so for two weeks. And it's like, okay, so what's the next step? Whereas before, you know, like you immediately jumped in bed. So it's, but we're talking like all these different, um, decades, but what I found with um, marijuana use and then partners, you know, it's it's like everybody has their way of checking out or of detoxing off their day or something like that. And it comes down to, I think, compatibility and then attraction, especially when you're younger. It's like there's this you know, heavy attraction, you know, it's like, I think older, it's harder to be attracted to somebody. I don't know. They got to do a lot more something, or maybe it's just me. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, the idea is like when you're younger, you're building. And then when you're older, you're just trying to be comfortable. So it's a different criteria. And then now I think, you know, speaking to my friends who are, you know, in their mid thirties, it's it's they're not seeking to build families not everybody is seeking to build a family and i think that was different when i was growing up it was i went to a mills college um you know the, everybody graduated and it was like 
it wasn't like, oh, everybody goes to work. Whereas like now it's, it's common, you know, it's mm -hmm. totally common before it was like, oh, well, maybe you could get married and have kids. And, and that was like, oh, you know, that was like a serious viable option. And, it, and it was for me. So, um, you know, it was just a different way of being. And I think that the world got a lot more complicated, a lot more um, full of distractions and just a lot more shit to manage. So, um, you know, if you're with somebody who doesn't smoke, they might not, that, that might end up being a deal breaker down the road or, you know, or if someone drinks a lot, you, you, you need to drink a lot too, because <laughs> it's hard to watch someone do that. So it's, I, th I think it comes down to compatibility and like when you're younger, it's attraction and, and common goals. Um, you know, those kinds of things. Right. I, I two quick follow-ups on that. Uh, the first is you said that drug use and sex like went hand in hand. And why do you think that was? Was it because like smoking weed was seen as adults or cool or because it was seen as like a way of lowering, lowering inhibitions and it was like an easy way to help with hookups? Um, I, I think it was just prevalent. You know, uh, there, there were like, you know, three things that were kind of prevalent that back then, I think in my circle. And it mm -hmm. was, it was cocaine was around, weed was around, and then alcohol. And then depending if you went for, you know, uh, who your partner was or whatever might be something else. But you, you, you know, I didn't, I didn't dabble in anything like that. And it was, um, people were more just into like having fun, you know, going out to eat, having fun, dancing all night, um, not, not giving a shit, you know, not, not really caring. Um, not being serious the people mm -hmm. were a lot more carefree and it was it was really was the early 80s so you and, and I was in San Francisco and I had a lot of gay friends and um, this was a little right before AIDS was coming out I think AIDS came out like in 83 or something like that so um, I had I had a lot of um, yeah I just had a lot of gay friends mm -hmm. so <laughs> you know, so it does like, it does sound like the messages you were receiving about like sex and drug use were coming a lot from your friend circle. And I'm interested if you remember your family, your father uh, or your siblings saying anything about, you know, what your goals should be relationship wise and how you should conduct yourself. Um, I would well, like I to mention, sorry, Bibi. Um, obviously there was some sort of message that you received from high school going to an all girls Catholic school. There was some sort of like, um, don't have sex until you're married and, and things of that sort. I'm assuming since you did grow up, um, and, and go into a Catholic school, that was like the messages that you got. Was there any like direct messages about drugs and dating, um, from that portion of your life? Um, no, in, in, uh, at Mercy High School, no, but at home, my sister came home pregnant at 15 and Mercy High School wouldn't let her finish her high school there. So she nice. went to UC Berkeley and graduated 18. So I had this mixed <laughs> message around, you know, uh, having babies and, you know, and, and, and it, cause, cause really it was just about sexual energy. There was so much sexual energy there. It's like, where did it go? And then if you didn't have birth control, then you had babies, you know, I was, I was, I helped raise my niece, you know? So my thing was, is like, don't get pregnant you know, have a good time and hopefully become a dentist because that's what your dad wants you to be, you know, and I didn't, but I escaped his uh, disapproval by marrying someone who could take care of me. So he was, he was okay with that. That's interesting. Um, so just moving on slightly, you married an Asian man, correct? Right. So I married an Asian man and that's the other big thing about our family was we were like a rainbow family. My sister had a child and married um, a black man. And my niece, Hermione, uh, named after my mother, uh, is black, half black. And um, then I married an Asian man. And then we have an, a gentleman from Saudi Arabia, also in the family. I have nephews, you know, six foot four these big guys whatever they're so beautiful but we have a very very mixed 
family. So what I believe is that, you know, I mean, love, love really, you don't, you don't, when you love somebody, you don't see colors. And, and I don't think we were brought up to be racist and, and, um, uh, whatever. I mean, I ended up marrying an Asian man. So I mm -hmm. just, um, I was seduced by him. I loved him. And, and it wasn't like anybody hated Asian people. Cause I think my dad had an Asian girlfriend too. So it's like, everybody was, it was, you know, we didn't, we dated other races. Right. Yeah. The, the only reason I ask is um, the United States still a, 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 a very high percentage of people disapprove of interracial dating. And so it's interesting to me that in, you know, 40 years ago, you were able to do that and not have a lot of disapproval from your family or community. And I can definitely see Asian being a lot more accepted given the high percentage of Asian people in San Francisco. But it's fascinating that your whole family, it seems, was able to pull that off without any, you know, social repercussions. Well, I, I think actually I was I've been thinking about that back then. I think I feel like I saw a lot more interracial couples than I do now. Hmm. And and I don't know whether it's and or whether I just didn't give a shit what other people thought. <laughs> and I was so happy doing my own thing because I was so in love and so happy. I swear to God, I was so happy. And and I was so in love. So it's and and also to even you know getting divorced, it took like three years to get this person out of my fantasies. I couldn't even fantasize about somebody else. So I was deeply in love with that Asian man. And and you, when you think about your family, it's like okay, so maybe that person's family is all white because they see this white woman. Well, my family is not. So race now, forty years later, whatever it is, it it I see things differently. And what I do see is that the people in my family who are mixed race have had a much more difficult time than the people who are white in my family. Hmm. That's disheartening, but that's another subject. Hmm. So going back to your dating life, uh, can you talk a little bit about when you were dating, what kind of your best and worst dating experiences were? Do you recall any particularly good or bad oh examples? <laughs> Oh my God. I was like the worst. It's like, oh, those are the ones you block out. But then I remembered one. So um, I was, um, I had a brief moment and during the summer working in uh, Half Moon Bay at this bar and I had a friend in San Mateo, Candida, and we were double dating and we got picked up in the bar by these two guys. And I remember, oh my God, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. Um, because they took us to this like little uh, camper thing and um, they thought, oh, we're, we're going to get drunk with these girls and have sex with them in this like tiny little camper, whatever. And I'm like thinking, okay, these guys obviously are both married and we got to get out of here. So I was just like reminiscing. It's like, well, what made that bad? And it was like, it was alcohol. You know, like if we'd been smoking a joint, it would have been the like the signs would have been different. But I think because we were drunk, we, when we got there, I think it's like okay, we're sobering up and we're gonna find a way out of here. So and then we did, but it was just <clears throat> it was just a weird thing. It's like um, there's a part of dating sometimes that can be very predatory, mm. and and it's usually the woman that's being preyed upon. So you know. And if you're naive, that's when you can be preyed upon and, and you can be naive at any age. It's interesting you mentioned that because we just did a two-parter on the book, The Gift of Fear. And the book discusses how certain individuals out in society have ill intent and you need to be able to recognize the signs and identify problematic behaviors that may indicate someone does not have your best interests at heart. And um, we were discussing this during the episode and I'm like, oh my God, this is like pickup artist dating strategies. Like all these things, they're like, hey, this is a warning sign that someone has ill intent is exactly what pickup artists are telling young men they should do in order to pick up women. Like walking up to women and like immediately invading their boundaries by like touching their shoulders or things and like not respecting their personal Fuck space. You. And, you know, <laughs> immediately doing the strategy called negging where you insult somebody in order to lower their self-esteem 
team and make it more likely they'll go out with you and all these like amazing, great behaviors. Um, and I told Naomi, like in the middle of the episode, I don't even know if I want to do a pickup artist episode anymore. Cause like as fascinating as that community is, it's just deeply depressing how much of it's just predatory behavior. Well, I'm just glad that there's more literature on it now. I feel Mm -hmm. like a lot of the time, like, Bibi, you're talking about, like, experiences where you just felt icky. I'm glad that there's, like, literature on it and and it's more of an open conversation than it ever has been. I agree with you, Naomi, because the thing is, is that you, 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 you are born with this beautiful heart and you're open and whatever, and then you're taught ways to manipulate or or condemn somebody and they're doing it for whatever reason and you have no idea you're being manipulated but if you hear about it and you read about it you go oh shit did that happen to me then then you might go oh no you cannot what do you call that negging you know whatever mm-hmm. that that stuff you you, you 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 become immune to it because you go oh that doesn't feel right i've heard about that right and, and i think you- that Sorry, go ahead, Amy. Oh, I was just wondering, Bibi, did you ever have like a proper conversation with anyone in your life about consent and what that means, either sexually or in any other context pertaining oh. to? No, you see, it's it's all, it is all education. It is all education because the thing is, is that <clears throat> when I'm before marriage, it was like, okay, so if you go out on a date, the guy pays, you usually have sex. But but that was kind of like your intent anyway, if I was dating my intent, that was my intent. Right. But now it's it's like, no, if a woman goes out with a guy and she doesn't want to sleep with them, she doesn't fucking have to. And Mm -hmm. there's this other part of um, the financial part that is different, that that I don't have experience with that is new, that I think there's a lot of pluses to. But it's. it's more balanced now and women can be more empowered now, but they still got to stand up for themselves, you know, which is, I, I, I'm thinking about that, what you're that, saying. That time of the gentleman is all, all, all gone. Yeah. I'm thinking about what you're <laughs> saying, BB. And I'm reminded, and I listen to some podcasts that have comedians on them, like professional stand-up comedians. And they've talked about how the entire landscape of comedy has changed because it used to be back in the day, you could have one stand-up uh, piece, you know, like a 15, 20 minute uh, stand-up bit that you just travel around the country with. And you could, you know, make a living using, you know, 20 minutes worth of jokes you'd come up with. And now because everything's televised and everything's on the internet and, you know, there's a YouTube video recording of every single comedy set that's ever been done. They have to constantly be coming up with new material and constantly revising their bits because most of their audience has already seen their work. And in the same way, like, I I think it's really good that these educational resources regarding dating have become more popularized, where it used to be people, especially men, could use kind of predatory dating strategies because no one had seen these predatory dating strategies, like, on the internet because the internet didn't exist. This wasn't written down anywhere. And so, you know, a bunch of guys could meet in a dimly lit room and, you know, talk about the ways that they picked up women. And that was, you know, perfectly fine and acceptable. And women would never know that these strategies were being employed on them. But now, like, it's much more common and they have to constantly be going back to the drawing board and revising things in order to, like, be predatory, which sounds bad, but is good in the sense that um, uh, I, I, I think it's harder now for someone with ill intent to do things that people aren't expecting, if that makes sense. I think so, too, because what our inner compass, our, our uh, most primitive part of our brain, when we are listening to it, we can sense danger. So it's mm. intuitive. So it's like we hear this education and all this stuff, and then we're around an energy that does not match um, ease, doesn't, you know, you want to run. Then it's it, it's like it, it is. It, I, I mean, I think what it is is that we're becoming more educated and people are really learning to trust themselves so that they can um you know, get what they want out of life and not get hurt. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think that's going to be a very big difference, you know, generationally is over time, more and more information has become more and more common, you know, constantly shared so that people are more aware that, you know, there are people with ill intent out there who want to do them harm and they'll know exactly what strategies they're employing. Um, and I think something that I've noticed in the last couple of years is like, um, a lot of women are very informed about, you know, the strategies pickup artists men will utilize and are much more protective of each other because they recognize when out in public, if someone is attempting to pick up a, you know, very inebriated girl from a bar, they're more likely to step in and do something about it because they're more informed and more willing to take action. Um, so, you know, I think that goes to the idea we've discussed a couple of times that sex education is good. <laughs> Um, oh even gosh, if parents yeah. don't want it, uh, you know, so, there's so much pushback, it seems, in schools these days. But regardless of whether or not parents want their kids to learn these things, these are important skills that kids need to know, right? They, they, they're going to have sex at some point. It's important that they have the tools necessary in order to prepare themselves for that. Not even oh, just you. sexual education, just talks about consent would be extremely good. Like, oh, it's all wrapped up in the same, like, no, yeah, yeah, I understand. But if they're not going to teach sexual education, they should at least teach consent at the very least. That's fair. I, no, that's a good point. I, yeah, it, it's, yeah, exactly. Because the, the bottom line is, is that everybody has the right to feel good in their body. And, and that's about teaching that everybody's equal, that everybody has the right to say no or, 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 or to say yes. You know, it's not one person has more power over the other in any situation. Mm -hmm. So jumping back to your dating life in, you know, the distant past, you talked a little bit about going to parties and meeting new people. Was that the primary way you like met individuals you were interested in dating? Where did you meet them, you know, at college? Um, how were you like connecting with people in your social circles? So, um, Mills, Mills was, is it all, or now it's like no longer whatever. <laughs> they, I don't know, they're, they're joining Northwestern University or something. But um, back then it was all women's college and um, they would have dances on campus. Hmm. So uh, you would meet guys at on campus, and um, I pretty much it was like it was it was like the guys would come to us, you know, and you know we would just go out on dates. Um, I met um, my husband; he was dating my good friend at the time. Um, she's still a good friend um, in college, and. Um, a couple years afterwards, I guess they broke up and then he ended up seducing me. But uh, he was, uh, he actually uh, sold weed on campus. So I was, you know, you know, I, I mean, there was just weed everywhere. It was, um, weed was, you know, people, you know, you go to, it was a very fun life. It was like you go to classes, you sit in his classes, and and then you go home and do your homework and play backgammon and smoke weed, <laughs> you know. And then and then you go to the the dining hall where somebody prepares your food and then you know does your dishes. I mean, it was we had no idea how much fun it was, you know. And then you go out on a date or you know hang out with guys, and you know it was just I mean. It was very open. I mean, and, and then also to the women there was, um, you know, a lot of the women had uh, female relationships. So it was it was on campus. Now, I'm, I'm this is just bringing back a lot of memories. And it wasn't like so there was a lot of bisexuality there. We didn't know, you know, it was like, uh, you know, it wasn't that open. Like, I think nowadays it's like very open. Everybody's very fluid. There's a lot more um openness about bisexuality um you know the and back then it was like okay it's just a stage or something and you know but it was really common but not for me mm -hmm. it's interesting you mentioned that the school organizing dances and bringing in boys um when i was talking to my friend werfel who attended harvard he mentioned that there are buses that are 
get come to Harvard every weekend from the all women's schools in the area and vice versa. And so like the schools are directly supporting, I guess you could say hookup culture, but I guess more accurately, like relationships and attempting to give people, you know, the options of meeting individuals. And I have to wonder, you know, was it your experience that back in the day before dating apps and, you know, people had the opportunity to search out people on their own, that there were schools and other community organizations attempting to facilitate relationships where they'd host dances and meetups? I definitely think so. I mean, I think that um, like Mills had this van that would bring us to Berkeley to to study or whatever. And I would just go to Cafe Med and, you know, check out people and stuff and maybe, <laughs> maybe do homework or, you Oh, know, you were doing so, homework. All right. Yeah. It was the, it was bullshit. You know, it was just checking out people. So it was, it would, I, I definitely think there was that element, you know, like, to me, a dating app is like super foreign to think about, you know, but back then it was, it was, um, and then my friends, like my gay friends, I would love watching them date because they would just, I shit you not, my f best friend, Randy, he would, we would be driving. He would look at somebody at the um, cable car stop. They would have this look lock and then they would be having sex an hour and a half later. I was just like, amazed you know so that's the way people hooked up you know back then it was it was very much about you know the physical attraction and you just it, it was very it was very immediate and and i think that the phones have really stopped a lot of that energy well i Not think it's I know from firsthand but i just i just have a feeling that's a huge distraction now I think mm -hmm. it's that and it's also the um, spread of information about like sexually transmitted diseases. You said that when you were um, you were having fun in the 80s before the AIDS pandemic. Is that considered a pandemic? Yes. Uh, yeah, I want to okay. say over a million people died. It was OK. OK. I just good. didn't know if it was classified as a pandemic or not. Um, but you mentioned that it was very loose. Was there a, a difference in the way that your gay friends dated after the AIDS pandemic started? Well, I, I think I think what happened was is that um, I got married and I got involved with you know raising boys. Oh my God, my boys are just having a wonderful life at home and everything. And so. Um, I had like gay friends in college and then a lot of them passed away and I didn't really carry them over to the same friends, um, you know, after my kids were, you know, were like five and seven or something. So then I had a new set of gay friends come in and at that point, and they, they were able to take like, um, I think there was a drug called AZT or something that back then that would help them uh, manage the disease. And um, so, so they had, so they had, you know, had a lot of sex or whatever, unprotected sex back then. That's what was the problem. Um, you know, and then had these drugs to keep them alive. But um, it, it was, how do I want to say, I, I wasn't that involved because I had a family, but I would like, you know, raise money for the AIDS walk or do something like that. And I think, um, you know, people were still pretty loose in that community because, you know, my friend would talk about how much sex he would have. But, um, you know, um, I, I don't know about that behavior. You know, I, I guess I guess I can't really base it on uh, the the few people that I knew, but. I think that at that point, they, there were drugs to help stop AIDS. You know, you could keep it at HIV. So um, that was great. I, I just want to throw something in. I did check, and it looks like AIDS was actually classified as an epidemic. So the difference between the two is an epidemic is a disease that affects a large number of people within a specific community, population, or region. And a pandemic is an epidemic that's spread over multiple countries or continents. So if it's like concentrated in a particular group or area, it's a epidemic. And if it's a global thing like COVID, it would be a pandemic. So yeah, AIDS was an epidemic. It was just really sad because that's when um, uh, 
Brownie Mary and Dennis Perone. Dennis Perone got all these signatures to make medical uh, cannabis legal for all these people suffering from AIDS. And it was just, and they would always be in, at the AIDS parade. I always took the kids to the AIDS parade and or a few times. And it was, it was, they would be at the front, you know, because they basically made uh, medical cannabis legal. And it was, it was like, oh, okay. Y you know, I still felt like I had to, you know, I got it illegally, but it was, it was good that, you know, the work that was being done in that community and they were helping that community and, you know, it was just, I was just on the sideline, but I was, I was, I was, you know, this is, this is where the change happened in California. And I was just this little mom with these little kids and we're like, let's, let's go to the parade. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have taken them when they were three and five and stuff. I don't know. But it, it was, I, I just, I, I think what it was is I felt a lot for the community and I had friends that were gay and, you know, I didn't feel like, I felt like that's what was important. That's where my, my heart was. I think that the fact that you did bring them so early on was extremely important because there's talks now. I was speaking to a parent recently about the fact that he was teaching his five-year-old um, different like sexuality and, and different genders and um, uh, biological um, extremity. And that's a really bad way of saying penis and vagina, but um, he was teaching his daughter um all these things that you wouldn't normally teach a five-year-old, but doing it for safety reasons, but also for education purposes. And I think that it was important that you brought them to those AIDS parades, not just be AIDS parades. It's a great way of putting it. Um, was not only because- It was a gay parade. What am I saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't have enough coffee. Yeah, it wasn't like, rah, rah, up with AIDS. No, 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 no. It was the gay parade. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, I'm glad that you brought them because it, it introduces them to the fact that that was, that is okay. And, and everyone can love everyone. And um, it was, it's a great introduction by not introducing it yourself and saying, this is okay, but just bringing them and saying, this is normal. This is what I believe in. Um, you don't have to believe in it, but it's, it's normal and it's okay. So I think that the fact that you brought them so early and you introduced it as the subject of openness and love and we support these people um, was a great way of doing it. Yeah. I, I think, I think kids have to kind of be taught prejudice, like kids kind of emerge without a lot of like solid conceptions about the world. And if you tell them something, they'll just be like, Oh, that's how things are. Um, and you really have to like, beat it into them that, you know, something is morally incorrect. Cause if you just say, oh yeah, sometimes two men like each other, uh, they'll probably shrug and go back to eating their building blocks or you know, <laughs> whatever they're doing at the moment. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, again, this goes back to all this stuff in the media right now about whether or not teachers should be allowed to discuss sexualities in their classes with their students. And I, I think a lot of people have this idea. It's like, we're going to talk about anal sex with sixth graders. And no, it's like literally just, hey, sometimes two women might get into relationships. Sometimes two men might be in relationships. Sometimes people who look like they're male are actually female. And that's like totally fine and normal. And it's like the most basic conceptions. I don't think anyone's, I, I can't imagine there's a school anywhere that, you know, goes into graphic detail about how this works. It's more of just, we think it's important to normalize these things rather than treat them as like abhorrent. I don't know about you, but when I was in sixth grade, I would have loved to learn about anal sex. <laughs> <laughs> You're too funny. Well, Lovely. <laughs> Oh, wait, you're fanatic. No, it, it's, um, you know, or toys. Let's have some toys out there, you know, that that you don't know, is that a boy or a girl or whatever? It's like different. I think it, it has to happen also for adults because adults don't know how to articulate. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if it can trickle down there, that would be awesome. Or just like, this is what a picture of a family looks like, you know, and it's like, that's the family. You know, and so like on a macro level, I think all this stuff needs to be spoken about because 
I feel sometimes I'm still going to my adult children, you know, finding out about sex stuff. You know, it's like, okay, this is where you need to go on the internet, mom. But <laughs> you know, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a conversation that they need to have in school and everywhere, I think. It's just um, about including people. Let's include everybody. There's one more element that I think is interesting that you brought up earlier where, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems as though people were much more open back in the 70s and 80s about who they liked and what their intentions were. And that seems almost like something that we've lost because I've been watching a lot of trashy TV with my girlfriend, Lauren, Um, you know, like (laughs) Netflix shows about, you know, people falling in love, but they can only talk to each other. They can't see each other or a bunch of sexy singles. Yeah. Yeah. Or a bunch of sexy singles on an Island, but they can't have sex with each other. They have to go an entire month without having sex with each other in order to win the grand prize. But one thing that struck me as I'm watching this is these people don't know how to have like serious conversations with other individuals. Some of them are really good, but the vast majority don't even know how to say something as basic as I like you, right? They don't even know how to say something as basic as I have feelings for you. And and they seem almost like traumatized when they do finally get it out as though it's some horribly embarrassing secret that they can't possibly release. Um, And and so that, that's definitely seems like a cultural shift over time based upon your experiences, because yeah, if what you're saying is true and people were far more willing to, you know, hook up and whatnot, the fact we can't do that in the modern day definitely seems like we need to have some conversations about how do you express feelings? How do you make it clear to people, you know, you care for them? I think people need to give themselves permission, number one. And and you don't get that, I think, until you're older and you're, you know, I mean, it's hard for young people to give themselves permission where they haven't been before. You know, mm. that's the thing. And I think when you're older, you're like going, fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. I don't give a shit. Um, I pay my own bills, you know, so, <laughs> uh, you know, you might go there or you, you, you ha- you're less invested in other people's uh, opinion of you. Mm-hmm. And, um, shoot, where was I going with that? Um, people need to give themselves permission in order to, they need to give themselves things. permission. And then I think that it's scary to, to be intimate and we need to teach each other how to have a conversation and, and be okay with having a deep conversation and then not feel like you left part of your soul over there. Like that person owns part of you. It's mm-hmm. like, no, you, you shared a nice part of yourself and now they're touched. Period. Well, there's, there's this element of shame and I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if it's taught or if it's not taught, but I feel like in my generation, especially people aren't willing to be vulnerable because they feel like they're going to be judged. And that might just Mm. be because of social media, because there's this always going to be an element of judgment um, on social media. But I think that it's crazy to see, like, I'm, I consider myself a very vulnerable person. I'm willing to have those conversations with people and I don't know where I got it and and nobody else did. (laughs) And it might just be the way I was like raised or um, it might be the way that people teach their their kids to not uh, speak or that it's a reflection that their parents don't have conversations, vulnerable conversations like that. But in some way, people are not taught that being vulnerable is okay. And I want to know specifically where that comes from. I mean, I'm thinking it's very much a media thing because I'm trying to think of, you know, families in media that are open and like affectionate and, you know, constantly talking about their feelings. And I would say the primary archetype is like a husband who's super stoic, right? You know, he rarely says how he feels, but, you know, every so often he saves his family from danger or whatever. And you're like, oh, he he really cares, right? The <laughs> fact he didn't let his family fall into the volcano or whatever. But like, uh, yeah, I, I think... It, we are very much influenced by the culture that surrounds us. And if the culture that surrounds us refuses to put like positive examples of like open, emotionally vulnerable people up on screen, it's difficult to get the impression that you yourself should be open and emotionally vulnerable. And instead you should adopt the characteristics of, I don't know, all the trashy romantic TV movies you see rather than like characteristics of being a decent, vulnerable individual. 
So I want to bring up something because I I'm on uh, Instagram because because I am the Princeton Cannabis Review. But uh, <laughs> that's some good cross branding. I know. Um, but like your generation, Naomi, uh, Tom Holland and Zendaya, the stuff that they post is very authentic and very playful, and I think is I think is trying to switch that thing of 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 showing your vulnerability and 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 maybe that you have to be famous in Spider-Man and and Zendaya <laughs> you know but but they they're going to lead us they're going to lead your generation out because it's like I feel like it is sad it is sad that you can't be vulnerable you can't um uh, cuz somebody's going to come back and say oh my god I got a picture of that of you or something you know there's so um the paranoia the paranoia yeah. that you so I grew up with the shame of like smoking weed and being having to hide it but for, for you it's like okay so I have to be paranoid about what I say and do or how I look because yeah, yeah. you know and and that's 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 like a, a new psychosis we all gave ourselves or something you know and I don't think it's um you know um my hat's off to you to, and I think it's also because of the way you were brought up and you know your parents are together a nice and tech family um you know that's why i think you're strong enough to be able to be vulnerable with people and then come back because your base is solid you got a touchstone that's solid and and you know you got your brothers who you know totally protective of you so you have a really good core that has helped form you and help you be comfortable with who you are I think well you brought up Tom Holland and Zendaya and I think that's really funny because a lot of people I don't think there's a single person that I know that would be like oh I hate Zendaya and Tom Holland um because they're beautiful people for one but the second thing is that like I feel like they're so authentic and, and, and um, true to who they are. There's this element in Hollywood of, oh, you can't truly know who I am except for the actor or the actress or the person, the rock star that I am on stage. And I think that those two individuals specifically are breaking that barrier. They're uh, taking the sheet down between them and the audience. So it's more like a there you can see them fully for who they are because of not only what they post on social media, but how they act and the charities that they give to and so on and so forth. So I think that if people in Hollywood were more vulnerable um, and let you see into their life, there's a lot of shame, I think, that comes along with fame specifically. And um, not a lot of people understand that if you are more authentic um, to the audience, the audience is more receptive, I feel like. I want to push back on that slightly because I was watching the Love is Blind Japan version yesterday with Lauren. And BB, if Wait, you're not I have a aware- question. Mm-hmm. Is it in Japanese? It's subtitled. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, what's weird is that several of the people actually speak perfect English. And so every so often they'll have these conversations in like California English. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they're Japanese, which, which is interesting. Um, so, BB, the basic premise is um, people, men and women, get to have conversations with each other in these sealed booths where they can never see what the other person looks like. And the idea is over the period of a month, they're going to have enough conversations to really like truly understand who that person is. Um, and then they have the option if they'd like to propose to that individual and get engaged. Uh, but the whole idea is like you're going to fall in love with like this mental image of someone rather than, you know, an actual physical attraction. Maybe that'll overcome a lot of people's biases. But I'm watching this episode and set in Japan, and it seems so voyeuristic. We're like, people are having these raw emotional conversations about their vulnerabilities and their past trauma, being in relationships and being cheated upon and their husband, you know, who was gambling constantly and lost all their money. And they're attempting to break down the barriers with other people. And I'm just sitting there feeling really awkward and gross. Like I've just popped open a window of someone's house and I'm like peeking in. Um, And I feel while it's good to have all these representations I would prefer almost that they be fictional and not real because I don't want to take away people's privacy and their ability to express themselves openly. It just seems so gross that I'm like, 
watching the two most intimate moments of people's lives be, you know, broadcast nationally or internationally. And now everyone knows, you know, their vulnerabilities and their weaknesses. And that, you know, is something that can constantly be used against them moving forward. So yeah, like I, I would say to your point, Naomi, it's good to have like real people expressing themselves, but it also feels like that's taking away a huge element of their like personal self dignity if that makes any sense and i'd prefer you just come up with fictional stories about people who get along and treat each other with respect i don't know i i would say that definitely there's an element of yes there needs to be some sort of privacy but i think there's also a an in-between where you can have um that element of privacy but also that element of openness so um, I would definitely say that I would like to see more of it because I think that a lot of people look up to these individuals, basketball players, football players, uh, um, people in Hollywood, singers, um, things of that sort, and they um, base their actions off of what they're doing. And you see that especially in the, the Kanye situation. Um, it uh, Bibi, I don't know if you're aware, but Kanye West is like this huge uh, rapper in um, LA and he okay. is known internationally. He was married to Kim Kardashian. They're in the middle of a big divorce and he's openly um, threatening her new boyfriend for uh, like dating somebody else. Um, he, he's uh, making it very obvious that he doesn't want this man to be alive. He's like, oh, I want my family back together. But he um, is mentioning the fact that he's with a new girlfriend, even though he's like, oh, I want my wife back. But also I have this girlfriend who's a dominatrix. Um, he was just posting um many times about the fact that he wants his family back and he wants his wife back and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like this is going to have a lot of ripple repercussions, ripple repercussion, <laughs> just repercussions because his fan base, there's some people that are so into um, Kanye West and, and it's the same with every other um, person that has a following. There's some people that will take that literally and they will start to base their actions off of the bad actions that their the, their hero has okay so so here's my thought on this i think kanye west lost me when he was talking about how he was gonna he and kim were gonna abort their first child i was like you know what i'm not gonna read anything he writes or says you know he's not gonna get any of my energy and then just the other day somebody gave me a people magazine and i saw his new girlfriend so i was like going oh Okay, that's her, who she is, whatever. I just looked, right? So I think that with our idols, what we find that sometimes they're big fucking bullies. He's a mm. big fucking bully. And if he kills this guy, I hope he fucking goes to jail. And I don't, and I don't wish that person to die. Okay? He's a big fucking bully. And as many uh, artists, people who love this artist... A lot of people are going to drop away because you know what? This is unacceptable behavior. It's like, okay, yeah, so your family broke up. It's ugly, but you don't get to go and say you want to kill people and then and then be threatening. And, you know, it's just, it's just ugly behavior. And you find out that sometimes when people have more money than they need, they become bullies. And that's just what happened with him. Well, I think it's that and a mixture of uh, mental health issues that have gone oh, into. <laughs> so um, I don't know the specifics about his health history, but I do know that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and um, basing off of the actions that he's had recently, I'm assuming that he is not taking his medication. So, um, so, so then that opens up the question of, it was like, okay, somebody with mental health issues who has money then commits a crime, do they get away with it? Yes. Well, as we all know, absolutely. Uh, as we all know from the OJ Simpson trials, um, money is not, uh, sorry, the law is not black or white. It's green, as in money green, as my dad always says. So um, as long as you have good lawyers and a lot of money to back that up, I'm pretty sure he will not be going to jail. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, BB, um, regarding mental health, because there are many people who have bipolar disorder and they like one, don't use that as an excuse for their actions. And two, if they do act out, 
they probably go to prison because they're not uber wealthy. And that's frustrating that individuals with power can always use that as an excuse. And like, I, I'm not doubting that like Kanye's had like mental issues and appears to have had public breakdowns over and over and over again over the years. It's to say that like in our society, we let influential people get away with so much bad behavior. And perhaps that's the reason that so many people think that bad behavior is okay is because these people who are idols get away with it so often. Right. Mixed messages. It, it, mm-hmm. You know what it comes down to is it's race and resources. If you have enough resources to protect you, you can get away with anything. And if you're the right race, you also have access. So, you know, it's, it's it's sad. It's sad because it sets an example that is not good. Right. So we are approaching, I think, the cutoff for our first session. Naomi, was there anything else you wanted to get in before we jump into drug use in part two? No, let's jump into drug use. Okie dokie. Well, BB, thank you for us. Thank you for coming on our show for part one. We will resume our conversation in just a moment. Um where can people find you online if they're interested in following your podcast? Well, I am on uh, pretty much every platform. I do have a website, uh, PrincetonCannabisReview.com. And I would love to um, have you follow me on Instagram. And um, that's I think you're Princeton Cannabis Review on Instagram, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, thank you again, BB. Um, we will resume this conversation in just a moment. Um, bye for now. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You guys have a good day. I miss the old Kanye, straight from the gold Kanye, chop up the soul Kanye, set on his goals Kanye. I hate the new Kanye, the bad mood Kanye, the always rude Kanye, spaz in the news Kanye. I miss the sweet Kanye, chop up the beast Kanye. I gotta say, at that time I'd like to meet Kanye. See, I invented Kanye, it wasn't any Kanye. And now I look and look around and there's so many Kanye. I used to love Kanye, I used to love Kanye. I even had the pink polo, I thought I was Kanye. What if Kanye made a song about Kanye? Call him Mr. Old Kanye. Man, I be so Kanye. That's all it was, Kanye. We still love Kanye. And I love you like Kanye loves Kanye. We have many thanks for the use of our theme music, which is the song Drop by Ketza. You can find more of their music online at ketza.uk. You can also find Date These Guys online on Twitter and Instagram at Date These Guys or visit datetheseguys.org. If you have questions for the podcast or want to be a wealthy sugar parent, send an email to datetheseguys at gmail.com. If you're looking to make an impact in the world, this show strongly recommends Planned Parenthood, a nonprofit organization that provides reproductive health care in the United States. Planned Parenthood provides birth control, long-acting reversible contraceptive implants, clinical breast examinations, pregnancy screenings, prenatal care, testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections, and abortions. They also do great work for those who are lower income. Four-fifths of their clients are at or below 50% of the federal poverty line. Both Joel and Naomi are monthly donors to Planned Parenthood. We hope you will be too.